What we do as a company is that we make general aviation practical for everyday mobility. And with the flying car, you can really go from any door to any door in the world. Welcome to Third Angle, where cars with wings take to the skies. I'm your host, Paul Hames, from industrial software company PTC. In this podcast, we share the moments where digital transforms physical, and we meet the brilliant minds behind some of the most innovative products around the world, each powered by PTC technology. From Chitty Chitty Bang Bang to Back to the Future, Blade Runner, and even Harry Potter, we've long been bewitched by flying cars on the big screen, longing for them to become a reality. In fact, people from across the decades have often said that the advent of flying cars will be the sign that the future has really arrived. But up until now, that reality has been very much confined to the realms of science fiction. But what if I told you the future is closer than you think, and we're just a few short years away from sticking your car in flight mode and taking to the skies? Pal V is building the world's first road legal flying car, and it's really close to liftoff. The PAL V Liberty is a stunning feat of engineering, and to find out about it, our producer, Leo Neonkan, went to PAL V's tech center in the Netherlands to meet marketing director, Joris Walters. So the PAL V flies like a, like a gyroplane, and the gyroplane is different to a helicopter because the main rotor system is not powered by an engine. So we have a propeller on the back that pushes it forward, and the main rotor is just spins by the aerodynamic forces. It's a bit of like a windmill, but then turn 90 degrees. That creates a lift. And it makes it a very stable aircraft to fly and therefore easy to fly and very safe to fly. And we can fly up to three and a half kilometers if we want to. And the maximum airspeed is about 180 kilometers per hour. And once we land it, we can fold it easily back into drive mode. And then we can drive it on the roads to a maximum speed of 160 kilometers per hour. What we do as a company is that we make, let's say, general aviation practical for everyday mobility. And with the flying car, you can really go from any door to any door in the world. So in this particular case, if we look to the PALV Liberty, you will park it at your, at your house, you will drive it to the nearest airstrip, and there are about 10,000 registered airstrips in Europe and about 14,000 in the US. And that's where you unfold your vehicle and that's where you take off, fly 500 kilometers in distance, land again and drive the last part to your final destination. And that's something you cannot do with vehicles or aircraft that we nowadays have. That's what we change. And that makes, so driving an aircraft allows you to use an aircraft for mobility. So if we look at the vehicle and we start in the front, then you will see there is only one wheel in the front and two wheels in the back. And that has mainly to do with weight. And when we drive, we actually lower the vehicle to such a level that is still very stable when cornering. And when we fly, we can raise the complete vehicle up to about 35 centimeters higher. It's a two-seater, so it fits uh, two people and a bit of luggage, about 20 kilograms of luggage. When you drive, you use your normal steering wheel like in any other car. And when you fly, you can unfold your flight stick and use that for flying. So starting from the front to the top of the vehicle, you will find the rotor system, which is now folded away and makes the vehicle very compact, only four meters in length. But when it's unfolded, it's almost 11 meters in length. So that's also quite an engineering challenge to get it from that, that status to a compact car that you can comfortably drive on the road. And even more importantly, that you can just park at a normal parking spot. Because if you have a flying car that doesn't fit anywhere, when you drive it, then the practicality of your flying car becomes a lot less. So then we have the cabin, it's the front of the, of the vehicle and the engines are actually in the back. So we have uh, the engines in the back, which are powered by a Rotex engine. It's a four cylinder boxer engine, which powers the drivers of the car. And when we fly, it powers the, the propeller. So if you open the doors, then you will see the two seats, the steering wheel that we use for driving, and then there is a stick, a flight stick folded away into the seat. And you will see the dashboard with a lot of different buttons. 
If you go into here, you will feel yourself a little bit of a James Bond, I assume. And we don't have the ejector seat, but it looks like it. And then we have uh, so an electronic flight instrument that we use for flying. We have the, the driving display that we, uh, we use for driving. And there, there are two engines in there, so a left and a right engine that we use both when we fly and only one when we, uh, when we drive. Can we get in the car? Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to sit like that because... Okay. So it's quite comfortable. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. So the seat itself is not adjustable, but the pedals will be. Because this also has to do with weight. So if you want to make a seat adjustable, you will again add weight. So instead we made the pedals and the, and the steering wheel adjustable to still make, it, make you feel comfortable, but decreasing the weight a lot. And also if you look around, you will see a lot of carbon. So if you look, for example, to the doors, it's all from, made from composites, which we have to use to really reduce the weight of the vehicle. So if you look at the dashboard, then from right to left, then you will first see all the engines. So we have two engines on board, and you will find the buttons for, for example, the fuel pumps, uh, the lanes of the engines, etc. Then you will find your transponders and communication, uh, and then you will see a bigger screen, which is the instrument flight information system. Next to that, you will see a driving display, and then above your steering wheel, you will find your altitude meter and also your sp speedometer. We did fly already with our prototype in 2012, and that's actually the vehicle that you're seeing here in this hall. Yeah, so that's uh, built between 2009, 2010 to 2012. And it was really to show to investors, but also to the world, that, uh, that it was possible to not only build a flying car, but also to do it within existing regulations. And the last part is extremely important uh, when you want to get a vehicle to the market in a realistic time frame. Because changing the regulations will take forever. Uh, but building a, a vehicle within existing regulations is, to our opinion, the only viable road to get a vehicle to the market. So in this hall, we make all the different test equipments for the Power of Liberty. And unlike you might think that aircraft are tested on, in the air, we do a lot of testing on the ground. That's because safety is something you want to test on the ground uh, and not something high up in the air. So we have a lot of different test vehicles that we use, apart from the Power of Liberty itself, of course. Uh, for example, what you see here is a pickup truck which weighs uh, almost four tons. That's how we, we actually use the rotor system, for example, up to a force of 3G, so 3,000 kilos. And that's how we can test different systems and different parts of the, the PELV before we really start flight testing them. So what you see in the back is a, is a Porsche that we have, and it's not like every Porsche that you will see driving around because it has an aircraft engine in it. So we actually are testing this Porsche on the road to test the vibrations on the engine because it differs from how you would use it in the air. So in the air you would fly at a constant RPM while driving you will have a different RPM continuously. So there's a different load to the engine and that's why we actually use a Porsche for testing the engine on the road. And as I say, this is how we test the different components of the vehicle before we really put it into the vehicle, approve it and start test flying. If you ask about how will this work in terms of regulations and uh, that side of the story, this is just a general aircraft and a, and a, and a car. So it complies to both sets of regulations. You, yes, you can drive them on the, on the highways, and yes, you can take it from airports. So as soon as you convert it into an aircraft, it's an aircraft. You have your transponder, you have your communication on board, and you have all the gear that you need to safely fly from, from A to B. So in the air, you will be classified as a normal aircraft, not a special category or so on. And that has to do because we comply to existing rules and regulations. So everything to allow this vehicle to be on the market is there. So the infrastructure is there, regulations are there, licensing for pilots is there. Uh, we don't have to create that, we, we only add a vehicle. And that part is already difficult enough and we have been working on that for, since 2012 to get this vehicle to the market. 
So at the moment we are using two boxer engines, piston engines, uh, that use uh, regular gasoline. And in future, of course, we want to electrify the whole system. But at the moment, the weight of the batteries is, is just too heavy to be used in aviation. So to give you an, a brief overview of the, the vehicle itself, with 660 kilos. And at every kilogram that we add, we lose about seven kilometers in range. So you can imagine if we would install batteries into the vehicle, we would reduce from 500 maybe to 100 kilometers in range. So at the moment, it's not feasible to make a flying car that can have an acceptable range. Although we are speaking to a few parties to implement synthetic fuels, so carbon neutral fuels or e-fuels, how they are called. So that might be the first logical step also for aviation to implement and to really decarbonize the aviation industry. So it's not just our goal to set a product onto the market, but we also want to be turning aviation from this high carbon industry to decarbonize the industry. And we can do that by these, let's say, little vehicles a lot more easier than by uh, the huge volumes that are required for uh, different applications. So as a company, of course, we have a, we have a roadmap that we foresee different products, uh, different variations of the vehicle. So for now, we have the Pelvi Liberty, which is a two-seater, which can be modified with different uh, power trains, so hybrid versions, electrical. And we expect to see that in the coming years. And then, of course, in the far future, but then, then I'm speaking about 2028 to 2030, we could possibly see a bigger version or a, a different type of vehicle. But in all things in aviation, everything takes time. Developing an aircraft from scratch to getting it certified will take you at least 10 to 12 years. And that doesn't really matter whether you are PELV or Boeing or Airbus. It's just a lot of paperwork that you have to go through in order to make sure that the vehicle is actually safe to fly. So designing something is one part, but getting it certified is definitely the bigger hurdle that you have to overcome. So if we look at our company, we spend about 60% of our investments into certification. That was Joris Walters from PAL-V. Now, outside of actually making the Liberty, PAL-V spends a lot of time doing paperwork, getting certification. To deal with the company's rapid growth and newfound need for strict data compliance, they needed a product lifecycle management software that could serve as a foundation for their business to build on. And they chose to host PTC's Windchill PLM solution on the cloud. Let's find out more. Time to meet our expert, Mark Lobo. So, Mark, we've spoken about windchill previously with Volvo Construction Equipment, but here we're talking about windchill in the cloud. And can you give the listeners an overview of what that actually means? Sure, Paul. So PTC has offered a cloud offering to our customers for the last 10 plus years. We do have industry verticalized offerings for federal aerospace and defense, as well as medical device manufacturers, given the high regulatory and compliance needs of those businesses. And this is important, I think, as we talk about PALV. So we refer to this as a private cloud offering for Winchill to differentiate it from the Winchill Plus SaaS offering on Atlas that we launched in April last year. So what's Winchill in the cloud? It's a comprehensive PLM solution for data governance and traceability, providing this authoritative source of truth for all kinds of data, whether it's product data or process data. Its open architecture enables easy integration with other enterprise systems because we know product development is a team sport and there's a ton of other systems that you need to connect with. And this then serves as the foundation for the product-driven digital thread. So this cloud managed service offering that we have makes the PLM solution easier to configure, to scale, and very important, it's secure. It really helps around facilitating this collaboration and agility across the enterprise, both internal and the extended enterprise, including how to work in remote environments. It was the only out-of-box implementation that they found which closely aligned with CM2 methodology. And what's CM2? It's a global enterprise standard for change and configuration management. And for many verticals, like the one that Pauli is in. This is a key piece to it. 
So why is this important? When product changes are needed, Windshield provides this ability to capture the issues or enhancements as they're coming in from the product development teams. It helps to document and implement related updates and then send out information through a prioritized change notice to all the stakeholders, whether they're internal to the company or maybe they'll be outside of the company. So Windshield connects systems all affected teams are automatically updated across the enterprise. And at the end of the day, it's really allowing them to focus resources on high value business opportunities and business outcomes. So understandably, there's a lot of compliance issues within the aviation industry. Everything has to be safe. It has to be traceable as to who supplied it, who designed it, when was it certified? So what part does Windchill in the cloud play in helping Palvi achieve their certifications? Yeah, compliance in aviation requires a lot of paperwork. I know we've joked in the past and said, if you print out all of the paper that goes into the certification and compliance, it's taller than the aircraft itself. <laughs> Lucky for us and the planet, this is now mostly all digital. So Palvi's unique design process needs made a highly capable PLM system a necessity. It's like table stakes for them. So how did they start? They started by studying the regulations they would need to comply with and then design their flying car with those regulations in mind. This encouraged them to use the data system that would be compliant with both local and international regulations as they made design changes in a controlled manner. Before they implement invention in the cloud, maintaining this compliance and making design changes required tons of manual processes and paperwork. So now they've combined both PLM and quality management into a single system. Now, as these processes are digitized, change management is really at the forefront of driving compliance, both for local standards and, com and international uh, regulations as well. In fact, PALV established this foundation for compliance across the entire company. By having this one system implemented in the right way, they've successfully complied with majority of the regulations all at once. And Winchell did 80 to 90% of what they needed to be compliant. And by this, they had a foundation for compliance across the company. Thanks to Mark and to Yoris for showing us around Palvi's headquarters. Please rate, review and subscribe to our bi-weekly Third Angle episodes wherever you listen to your podcasts. And follow PTC on LinkedIn and Twitter for future episodes. This is an 1860 production for PTC. Executive producer is Jackie Cook. Sound design and editing by Oli Giyu. Location recording by Leo Nyonkan. And music by Rowan Bishop.